Let's pray. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're doing just all over the world. We thank you for these, these amazing people. Lord, I pray that as I share that you would uh, impact them right where they are. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would hover over them, that they would sense your presence, that they would have encounters with you even as I uh, uh, share and teach with them. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I want to talk to you today about the third most impactful thing that's ever happened in my life. And you know, we often uh, say, well, that message changed my life, or that prayer changed my life. And you know, I mean, we, we mean well, but we often mean, we often actually mean like it influenced us, like it had a big impact on us. But I want to talk to you about the third most the third most important thing in my sorry the screen went away I don't know if a, are we good still okay I can't see you but hopefully you can see me right now it looks like you're in utter darkness and we're gonna call you into light I want to talk to you about the third most important thing that ever happened in my life before I do that I think I'll take you on a little journey to t- tell you about the first two I uh, my father drowned when I was three years old my mother remarried when I was five and she married a very violent uh, alcoholic. So uh, the first, uh, the next eight years of my life were pretty tormenting. My father was uh, very violent. Um, one time he, well, more than once, but uh, went to uh, give me a spank and pull my, my pants off and my underwear off and beat me with a belt. Blood was running down my legs. My mother was trying to pull him off of me. So that was kind of like, uh, welcome to a whole new day. I was five years old when that happened. And that scene repeated itself over and over and over. And uh, he, would, he would say, you're, you know, I didn't marry you, I married your mother. You're the trash that came with the treasure. And so I, I learned that, um, and he would say this, you're, uh, your children are to be seen and not heard. And so I, I learned that I was not very valuable and that I was basically in the way. And then, um, so at, when I was 13, my mother divorced him and we uh, moved into uh, a place that my grandparents owned, and it was a very kind of like, um, it was a very, very dark time in our lives, as you can imagine. My, uh, we began to have a prowler, like a, a, a robber, try to get in our house. Actually got in three different times in our house. So my mother was, uh, and we had the police over, uh, probably out of, you know, six, uh, out of seven days, six days a week, my, uh, a police officer would be at our house. Um, and this went on for like 9, 10, 11 months. And so now I'm like 15. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. My mom's sleeping on the couch with a shotgun. She's covered in psoriasis all over. It's in her hair. It's down her both of her arms, her legs, her knees. Every part of her body's covered in psoriasis. And my mom is crying herself to sleep at night. When you're 15 years old and you, you're, you know, you've got younger, you know, younger siblings and you're, you're, the only stability in your life is on, laying on the couch crying a pretty, pretty unstable situation. And so I, uh, I was sleeping with a shotgun. My mother was sleeping with a rifle. And then one night, one summer night, uh, uh, the prowler actually got into my room. And I woke up. I, sh- I yelled. And he jumped out the window. I took my rifle and took a shot at him. And uh, I-, I missed him. Thankfully, I missed him. And then you can imagine the next night I couldn't sleep. And I wasn't raised uh, I wasn't raised as an atheist I should say that I was raised to I we didn't we didn't talk about God once in a while my mom would pray for us but um I I didn't I wasn't raised to believe in God my grandfather the most influential person in my life was an atheist so he would he had influence in my life my mom definitely believed in God but we didn't go to church or anything like that and so I didn't really know if there was a real God and so at 15 I'm laying awake at night in the middle of the night My mom's weeping on the couch. I'm totally, you can imagine, totally tormented by the whole situation and having the guy in my room the night before. And I just said out loud, if there's a God, if you heal my mother, I'll find out who you are and I'll serve you the rest of my life. And an audible voice said, my name is Jesus Christ and you have what you you expected. Um, And so the next morning I woke up and my mother was completely well. The psoriasis was completely gone. And, uh, and, I, and I was like, you know, obviously a profound sign for me. And uh, about a week later, I was in, in, uh, in bed again. Again, it was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. 
And the voice came back. He said, my name is Jesus Christ. You said if I healed your mother, you'd serve me, and I'm waiting. And so I began the search. I had a girlfriend who now I'm now married to. By the way, I was 15, and she was 12. I've been with my wife since she was 12 years old. Uh, we got engaged when she was 13. Does that tell you how dysfunctional our families are? And uh, we got married when she was 17. And but this is our 49th year married. We have four kids and 12 grandkids, 11 grandkids and a, and a great grandson. So, so we, my wife, my the then girlfriend, we began this journey and we went from church to church to church. Um, I raised my hand three different times to receive Christ. Uh, I, I did, nothing happened in my life, nothing changed in my life, nothing changed in my heart. And so I was very disappointed, but what kept me going is this voice said, my name is Jesus Christ, you have it, you request it. So I knew there was a God because I had heard the audible voice of God. And uh, so we finally, you know, I, we ended up at this, um, this is a whole longer story, but for the sake of time, I'll shorten it. We ended up in this, in this youth group for hippies. We, I didn't, I wasn't a hippie. Kathy and I were, weren't hippies. I'd never taken drugs. I never drank. Uh, but my friend who I worked with said, you gotta, you gotta come, you gotta come. And so we ended up coming. It was at, in this house, there was probably 120 kids, all former drug addicts. I think we were the only two that weren't former drug addicts. They were long-haired hippies. And I didn't know it at the time, but they were Jesus people. And uh, we got into the meeting. Again, I had been in many, many meetings, uh, just going from Sunday to Sunday to church. And I, I would say, I'd go into a church and I'd say, the God who's with me, the God who spoke to me isn't here. And in fairness... He probably was there, but I didn't know what I was looking for. So we began, we sat, the, my friend said, if we don't get there early, you have to sit on the, you have to, you have to sit outside. So we got a half an hour early to the meeting. We ended up sitting in the front room. These kids crammed in the front room, up the stairs, in the kitchen, on the front lawn. They had two speakers out on the front lawn. And, uh, and they began to worship. And they began to sing, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And as we sang, different people just would stand up. And they would just stand up and they would give a 10 second testimony. Jesus healed my epilepsy. Jesus healed my tumors. Jesus healed me from cancer. Jesus delivered me from heroin. Jesus delivered me from LSD. And I mean, we'd have like 20 testimonies in this 40 minute worship. And I was like, whoa, bro. The God who spoke to me is in this room. So when worship was uh, over, the young man who was leading, he was probably, like I was 18, he was, by that time I was 18, and he was probably 22, and he said, does anyone want to receive Christ? And you know, my girlfriend and I, we both raised our hand, which by the way, this would be my number four time. I raised my hand. I prayed the same prayer that I had prayed three other times, as you can imagine. But I have to tell you that there was something happening in that room and, and I prayed with expectation I had never prayed with before because I saw these other people standing up and saying, God healed me of cancer. God delivered me from heroin. And so I'm like, the God who spoke to me is in this room. And I raised my hand. And then we finished the meeting, uh, you know, a, a half an hour, 40 minutes later. And the young man who, who was leading worship came over and he sat down next to me. And he said to me, you know, you, you, next to, actually Kathy and I are both sitting on the floor. And he said, you, you know, you just received Jesus and you're born again. And he explained the gospel in really simple terms to us. And he said, you, you're, you're, you're like a little child. You're, you're a child of God and you're like a little baby. You've just been born again and you need a father. Well, you can imagine my father drowned when I was three, as I told you. I've been like, I've been looking for a father my whole life. He brought two men who were probably four years older than me, five years older than me. Up to, up to us, and he said, which one of these men do you want to be your father? <laughs> and I just took the better looking one. His name was Art Kipperman, and he became our spiritual father. And, and he, Art, changed my life. And from that day forward, Kathy and I got married two years later. From that day forward, for the next three years, Art discipled us. He taught us how to read the Bible. He taught us how to pray. He taught us how to share our faith. He taught us how to worship. And I never, neither one of us ever turned back from that day forward. And the power of God would move through our lives profoundly. Like, I, I, it was 10 years before I would meet someone who didn't believe in the, in the power of God. I'm like, how can you not believe in the power of God? 
And then, like, we don't think prophets are for today. We don't think God speaks to them. Like, well, that's weird because I got saved by hearing the audible voice of God. So I think you're wrong about that. <laughs> I can't prove it in the Bible at that time, but I think you're wrong about that. So that was the most powerful thing that ever happened in my life. The second most powerful thing that ever happened in my life is I got married. <laughs> I got to tell you, like, marriage is good. <laughs> marriage will change your life. You get to have sex. It's all great. And uh, we, we, uh, we have uh, actually uh, been fruitful and multiplied. I won't say that. Let's just say we've been fruitful and multiply, and we've, uh, you know, we've read the Song of Solomon many, many times. Anyway, but today I actually want to take the next 30 minutes, and I want to tell you about the third most impactful thing that ever happened in my life. I was uh, now fast forward. I'm working at Bethel Church as a pastor and they gave me a personal assistant. I didn't know I needed a personal assistant, but I got one. And this is a very interesting story because my personal assistant is, is a prophet. Her name's Nancy. She doesn't work for me anymore. She worked for me for 10 years. But Nancy's a prophet, so we had a very interesting relationship. Like, I'd come to work, and she'd be like, you're fine, how am I? <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is going to be good. And the other thing about Nancy is she was, uh, you know, very sensitive, like, so I, I, let me, I have to tell you this if you, don't, if you don't know anything about me. Like, I don't hunt or fish. My wife hunts, she fishes, she, she has a, a bass boat, like she owns the bass boat. She went hunting last year with a bow and killed a bear. So my, my wife is a bad woman. Like if someone breaks into our house, I wake her up, I'm like, you should go check that out, I'll call the police. So she's, she's a tough woman. So I'm, I'm married to somebody that, you know, let me say this. I, I definitely cry way more than she does. So I end up with a personal assistant who cries all the time. Like she cried in the interview. So, and she tells me like, okay, you know, I, when I cry, don't worry about it. Because I, you know, I, I, I just cry. Like I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm sad. And, and then, I, then I cry in between. So, so, so anyway, she, it, it, about six months into her working for me, I come into work on Tuesday, that's kind of our Monday, and I go in the office and Nancy sits with me and she's briefing me for the week. Here's your meetings for the week. Here's what you're doing today. Oh, good. And, and while we're sitting there, she's crying. And I'm like, okay, like, I'm always like, you know, I'm not married to a woman who cries very much. So I'm like, this is a good cry. This is a bad cry. This is like, I'm a happy cry. I'm a mad cry. I don't know what kind of cry this is. So finally I say to her, like, hey, uh, Nancy, like, are you all right? And she's like, uh, yeah. I said, oh, okay. And she's like, no. I said, oh, well, did I say something to hurt your feelings? She goes, no. Then she says, yeah. I said, oh, what did I say? And then she said these words to me. She said, sometimes you don't understand how much people value you. You don't realize how much people value you and you step out of your office and you say things you think you're being funny but you're destroying the very people you're supposed to be leading with your words and I uh, said did I did I say something you know to you and she said yeah and so it was all good I had said something to her in sarcastic humor she she you know we we made up it was all good and you know she, she forgave me and honestly, like, this was my life with Nancy. So this was like, this is my 10 years with Nancy. So it was no big deal. I didn't even tell my wife. I just went home that night, didn't think about it again. That was early in the morning, that, the morning before, or that morning. So that night I go to bed and I have a dream. Have you ever have a dream where you can't remember the dream, but the emotion of the dream is totally on you? And it's like freaking crazy because you can't remember what the dream was? So I had this dream, and I don't know what the dream was to this day. I couldn't tell you. But I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it felt like I lost my best friend. Like I was grieving as if someone close to me died. And I, I, so I kind of slipped, my, I slipped up onto my headboard, and I'm, I'm laying there awake. It's dark in my room. And this, this, uh, this uh, voice in, inside my head, not, not audible voice, it, it's, it's saying, it's, it's repeating this, which I know, now know it's a verse, but then I wasn't sure. It says, uh, the world cannot hold up under a pauper or a slave when he becomes a king. The world cannot hold up 
under a pauper when he becomes a king. That's going over and over my mind. I have no idea. I did, that was, it's a proverb, so I wasn't reading Proverbs, so I, I don't know if I dreamt that verse or what. So I'm laying there, and I'm thinking about, like, half awake and half asleep, and, I, and, I, and I'm like, Lord, are you speaking to me? And he says, yes, you're a slave who's become a king. And immediately, I'm taken back in the morning in a vision to when Nancy says to me, you don't realize how much people value you. And you don't carry yourself like you understand that you're valuable. And you think you're being funny, but you're destroying the very people you're supposed to be leading with your words. So I, so I lay there, and the Lord said to me, do you know why Moses had to be raised in Pharaoh's house? How many of you know that story? Like, you know, maybe you've seen the movie or you read the Bible. So Moses, you know, Moses, the Pharaoh's killing all the firstborn children. He takes Moses, he puts him in a basket, he floats him down the river. The Lord said, do you know why Moses had to be raised in Pharaoh's house? I said, no. He said, because a man who's in slavery internally cannot free people who are in slavery externally. So it was necessary for Moses to be raised as a king, by a king, so that he could lead my people. And then... Immediately, I was taken back in a vision to my childhood. And the Lord said to me, unlike Moses, who was raised to be a king, you were raised to be a pauper. You were raised to be a slave. And I saw my two stepfathers abusing me. My, my father telling me, you're the trash that came with the treasure. I didn't marry you, I married your mother. And, and the Lord said to me, you were proactively, on purpose, raised to be a pauper but you've become a king, and it's time for you to change. And I don't know if you've ever had an experience where the Lord speaks to you, but when the Lord speaks to you and he tells you you're gonna change, <laughs> I'm sure this is bad theology, but it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel true. It doesn't, it, <laughs> it, let me say it differently. It doesn't feel like you have a choice. It feels like you're gonna change. And the Lord began to talk to me about how much he loved me and how much he valued me. And I was reading in those days, I was reading the book of Genesis. Actually, when I had this encounter, I'd been reading through the book of Genesis and I always liked the story of Jacob. I loved the character of Jacob in the Old Testament because I related to Jacob. Like his father didn't like him, his brother didn't like him, but his mother loved him. You know, I had a mother who loved me. You know, and, and how many of you know, like, your mother always loved you? Like, you, you, if you, you could be a drug addict, and your mother's like, he's studying to be a pharmacist. You know, you, your mother's just always loved you. And so I, I related to Jacob, and, and you may know the story, but Jacob goes down to this well, and he sees, uh, he sees uh, Rachel, this beautiful woman, and he's like, I got to marry this woman. So um, he, <laughs> he ends up talking to her father, uh, whose name is Lebon. Now, I have to tell you uh, just a, list, a little parenthesis right here. By this time, Jacob has a reputation for being a liar and a cheat. But what he doesn't realize is he's about to marry into a family whose lying is taken to a whole nother level. <laughs> so he makes a deal with her father, Rachel's father, Lebon, named Lebon, so that he can work seven years for Rachel. So they make a deal. Jacob works for Levin seven years. They have a big old wedding. They go into the bridal chamber to consummate the marriage. <laughs> Jacob makes up in the morning. Instead of Rachel being in his bed, Leah's in his bed, her older sister. <laughs> I don't know why it took him all night to figure out it wasn't... Rachel, but I just want to say thank God for electricity. So he comes running out of the bridal chamber, and he says to Levin, hey, did I not work like seven years for Rachel? And his father's like, yeah. He goes, well, that looks like Leah. By the way, this is all in Genesis 30 to 32. He's like, that looks like Leah. And his, his father-in-law says, well, I forgot to tell you, we always marry the oldest off first, so you work for me seven more years, and you can have... Rachel, actually, he said to him, listen, uh, listen, listen, I'll give you Rachel on credit. You can work for me seven more years and pay for Rachel, and you can have them both. So 
Jacob is, uh, yeah, he's not having a very easy life. You know, as I said, his father doesn't like him. His brothers don't like him. Mm. Now he's got two wives, and basically they don't like each other, even though they're sisters. So Jacob works for his father-in-law for seven, 14 years, and it, it's not good. Like, his father-in-law is a chronic liar. He's a chronic liar. He's a chronic cheater. And so Jacob finally says, I'm leaving. Listen, I'm leaving. I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my wives. I'm taking my, 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 my cattle, my sheep, and I'm leaving. And Jacob, Levin, Jacob's father-in-law, is a really good Jewish businessman. And he knows <laughs> that Jacob's making a fortune. So he says, listen, make a deal with me. I'll make a deal with you. And, uh, and I, 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 you know, I'll give you whatever you want. And Jacob says, wait a second, you cheated me 10 times. Like, why would I ever trust you? And he says, no, you name your wage, I'll pay it. And Jacob says, all right, I'll work for all the spotted and speckled sheep and goats. <laughs> the story gets crazy. He says, okay, you work for the spotted and speckled sheep and goats. And then Jacob goes down, this is Genesis chapter 30. Jacob goes down to the watering hole where the sheep and the goats mate. And he does this crazy thing. Like, Jacob is definitely a Pentecostal before there were Pentecostals. And he takes, <laughs> he takes a branch of a tree, and he, and he carves spots and speckles in it. <laughs> Guys, I'm not, I'm not making this up. You, you should look up Genesis 30, because some of you look like, what kind of a preacher is this? He goes down to the watering hole where the goats and sheep mate, and he puts the spotted and speckled branches in front of them only when the strong sheep and goats are mating. And the craziest thing happens. Whatever the sheep see when they're at their watering hole, that's what they reproduce. So all the like sheep that are like, you know, dragging a leg, got a bad eye, you know, those are all leavens. <laughs> and all the strong sheep and goats, they're all Jacob's. And I'm reading this during this year when the Lord is speaking to me. And, I, and I'm like, I'm, I'm listening to this. I'm, I'm reading this story and I'm like, wait a second. This is not about agriculture. And I realized something in this story. You do not become what you want to become. See, this story is not about agriculture. It's a prophetic parable about how God's sheep, how God's sheep reproduce. And I wanna point out that you don't become what you wanna become, but you become what you see at the watering hole of your imagination. Ladies, let me point out, before there were mirrors, before they invented mirrors, there were puddles. <laughs> and if, when you got up in the morning, you would go to a body of water, like a lake, a stream, uh, or if you didn't have any body of water around, there would be a puddle outside your house that reflected the sun and reflected your image so that you could, you know, fix your face or whatever you girls do that take an hour. I don't know what you do. Whatever that is, you make yourself beautiful. <laughs> and what I'm pointing out is Whatever you see at the watering hole, the sheep went to the watering hole, and when they saw the spot and speckle branches, they actually reproduced spot and speckle. And my point is this, is that God's sheep do not reproduce what they want to reproduce, but they reproduce what they see at the watering hole of the reflection of their imagination. And, and I want to point out this, that you always re reproduce what you see at the watering hole of your imagination, Proverbs says it this way. It's Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So, listen, I've figured out this out through my own life. There are two ways to live life. You can spend your life reacting to what you don't want to be. <laughs> or you can spend your life responding to the vision that God has for you. But here's the challenge. In order to react to what you don't want to be, you have to keep in mind what you don't want to be. In my case, I didn't want to be my two violent, crazy stepfathers. But here's the problem. You don't become what you want to become. 
You become what you see at the watering hole of your imagination. So here's the challenge. I didn't want to be like my stepfathers, but in order to, in, in order to not be like them, I had to keep in mind what they were like. And the challenge is, is that I was becoming like the very people I hated in my life. And here's my point, is that you will always reproduce the environment around you that you believe you have within you. John Maxwell said, you are not what you think you are, and you're not what others think you are. But you become what you think the most important person in your life thinks you are. Let, let me say it one more time. You're not what you think you are. Well, that's easy. You're not what others think you are. That's true. But you become what you think the most important person in your life thinks you are. Now, let me point out, like, I think that's true. And if the most important person in your life is God, then you become what you think God thinks of you. Let me say that again. You become what you think God thinks of you. But here's the challenge. If what you think God thinks of you is not what he thinks of you, then you are not becoming what God thinks of you. You're becoming what you think he thinks, which is not what he thinks. So you are not becoming what God thinks of you, but you're becoming what you think he thinks of you, which isn't what he thinks, so you're not becoming, a, a, you're not becoming a, a manifestation of his imagination, you're becoming a manifestation of your imagination, which is not what he thinks, so you're not being made in the image of God. <laughs> My point is this, how do I become what God actually thinks of me? will have to renew my mind. What does it mean to renew my mind? It means I have to think what God thinks of me to actually become what God thinks of me. Oh gosh, I don't know if you got all that. You should write all that down. That should take a few minutes. I, 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 wanna, I wanna go back to the story of Jacob for a minute because there's one more part of the story that's profoundly powerful. Jacob finally does leave and he's miserable. His brother wants to kill him his wives, they constantly fight. His father-in-law can't stand him now. His dad doesn't like him. And he is rich and miserable. And by the way, I'd like to point out, it's better to be rich and miserable than poor and miserable because at least you can go shopping. So you should write that down. That's Proverbs chapter 32. So he tells his wives... Some of you don't know how to take me. You're like, I just looked up Proverbs 32, and there's only 31 chapters in it. So he tells his wives, listen, listen, we're going to leave. We're leaving. He takes all of his sheep, all of his servants. He's like super rich. And he tells his wives, his two wives and his servants, he says, listen, you guys go to the next city. I'm going to go down over here to Jabbok, and I'm going to get my life together. So Jacob, this is Genesis 32. So Jacob goes down to a city called Jabbok. Now, in Hebrew, the name Jabbok means empty and alone. Anyone ever visited there? Anybody ever visited the city of empty and alone? Anybody ever born there? Anybody ever had an empty and alone experience? So Jacob goes down to, J to Jabbok and he prays for God to send him help. And God sends him an angel. And you know you're having a bad life when the angel who's sent to help you, he don't like you either. And Jacob wrestles with the angel all night. And finally, the angel says to him, let me go, my shift is over. And Jacob says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And the angel dislocates his leg. And by the way, he limps the rest of his life. But Jacob hangs on to him. And finally, the angel, it says that he wrestled with the angel all night and he prevailed. And finally, the angel says to him, get this, most important part of the message, what is your name? What is your name? And he says, Jacob. Now let me tell you, if your name's Jacob, we love your name, okay? Okay, someone put that in the chat. We love the name Jacob. But in ancient Hebrew, the name Jacob means liar, cheater, surplanter. 
His father named him Liar. It's a, you, know, you know you have a bad life when your dad names you Liar. I used to have a neighbor that named his dog Satan. <laughs> it was really strange when he'd call his dog. And when your dad names you Liar, not a good day. So the angel says to him, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. And the angel says to him, no longer shall your name be Jacob, but your name shall be Israel. Israel means a prince with God. Let me ask you a question. If you wrestle with the angel all night long and he broke your dang leg, would you let him go because he called you by a nickname? Not me. I'd be getting me some stuff. But Jacob lets him go. And I'd like to point out this. That sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will take away your future. And I'd like to point out that many people in the body of Christ, including me at that time, we grow up with a name. We live under an alias name that God did not give us. And I want to point out that names are prophetic declarations. Think about it. Woman never had a child till her name was changed to Eve, the mother of the living. And how many know, when Adam named the living creatures, he didn't call them Fa, Spot, Fifi, and Trigger. He actually gave them a name. I, I, I know he didn't speak English, but let's pretend for a minute that he sees a living creature that God created, and he calls him Lion, Lion. When Adam spoke to the animal, it says, and, and God, and it says, and Adam named all the animals in the garden. When he gave them a name, that name became their prophetic destiny. It became their prophetic DNA. It, be, it actually released in them their prophetic identity. How many know that Abraham never had a child? Abram never had a child till his name was changed to Abraham, the father of the living. Saul had to be changed to Paul, Cephas to Peter, the rock. He went from a broken reed to a rock. And I'm pointing out that there's something powerful about a name. But let me tell you that the, one of the greatest lies in Christendom is that you are a sinner saved by grace. Now before you hang up the phone here, I want to point out, you used to be a sinner. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Paul wrote, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The point that Paul's making is before we received Jesus Christ, before we received Jesus Christ, we were actually sinners, meaning that we were prone to sin. Isaiah cried out, there's none righteous, not even one. But how many know, when you receive Jesus Christ, when I received Jesus Christ, I became a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The word new there means never before created. Let me say this again. There's two words for the word new in the Greek. This word, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That word new is the word prototype. It means never before created. When you receive Jesus Christ, when I receive Jesus Christ, I actually got a new heart and I actually got a new mind. How many know that I went from sinner to saint and from going from sinner to saint is not called, it's not called sanctification, it's called salvation. When I received Christ, my old man died. Are you with me? My old man died and my new man came to life. What happened when I got saved and I got baptized. I, I, I don't know if you, if you know this, but baptism is not a symbolic act. Baptism is a prophetic act. Let me explain. Why do we take communion, for example? Jesus said that we take communion. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So how many know that communion is a symbolic act? Why do we take communion? So we'll remember what side of the cross we live on. Are you with me? But baptism is not 
a symbolic act. Yeah. Baptism is a prophetic act. What is a prophetic act? Do you remember when Naaman the leper, he came to Elisha's house and he, because he heard that Elisha could cure cancer? Elisha doesn't even come out of the house. He sends Gehazi, his servant, and he tells Gehazi, tell him to go dip seven times in the Jordan River and he'll be clean. And Naaman's mad. He's the captain of the enemy army. And he rides off into the sunset angry. He's got his right-hand guy with him. And, and, and he's saying, like, I thought he's going to tell me, like, he's going to wave his hands over me. He's going to do some Pentecostal thing. And I'm going to be healed. But instead he just says, go dip seven times in the Jordan River. And the, 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 his number two guy goes, says to him, well, boss, why don't you just dip? <laughs> What's the worst that could happen is you get wet. And so they go down to the Jordan River. They dip seven times. He dips him seven times, the, the Naaman, the leper. And he comes up the seventh time, and his leprosy is clean. He, he, here's my point. There's no magic in the water. S physical obedience brings spiritual release. Are you with me? Here's the deal. You empty, the, the Bible says that we carry our cross. How many know that we... We have to take up our cross and carry our cross to follow Christ. We must take up our cross and follow Christ. And where are we going? How many know Christ is going somewhere? So we enter the baptismal tank with a cross, but we exit with a crown. When we, when we, when we, <laughs> you guys are looking at me funny. Do you, do you understand that baptism is a prophetic act? Here's the first part of the prophetic act. We take you and we put you under the water. What does that mean? Romans 6 says that if we are baptized with him in the likeness of his death, then certainly we shall be raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. When I go into the baptismal tank and they put me under the water, how many know that's the first part of the prophetic act? And what's the first part? My old man is dead. 47 times in the book of Romans, it says you are dead, 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 dead dead, 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 times 10, add seven. You're dead. Your old man died. But here's the most powerful part of the prophetic act. When we pull you out of the baptismal tank, it says, listen, it says, if we are baptized with him in the likeness of his death, then surely we shall be what? Raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was, past tense, crucified with him. I want to tell you, a lie that I believed most of my Christian life. I love the Jesus people. They were so good, but they had terrible theology. And I was taught that there's a black dog in me and a white dog in me. The black dog was the old man, and the white dog was the new man. It was actually a beautiful illustration. And the preacher said, whatever dog I fed, that was the dog that ruled my life. Great illustration, only one thing. Not true. The truth is, is that my black dog, my old man, is dead. He's actually dead. In fact, we, we hear this, like, Paul said, our struggle, like Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, no, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What I'm getting at is this. If you believe that you're in a war with your old man, you can't win the war because you haven't even engaged the right enemy. As a matter of fact, you don't even have a weapon for your old man. Your old man, the only weapon you have against your old man is called baptism. If you're still dealing with your old man, you should go get baptized. You go, well, I've been baptized already. Well, let him hold you under a little bit longer. Because the only weapon you have against your old man is called, I kill you. Yeah, and it isn't self-destruction, it's baptism. Yeah, yeah. And when you come out of the water, how many know you're raised in newness of life? <laughs> There's a river that runs through your soul. It runs towards the throne. If you don't paddle, you'll end up at God's house. How many know that you are currently the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? <laughs> People say stupid things. Like, that you say, you hear them, you know, they sing a great song, and you're like, well, that was a beautiful, beautiful song. They go, it wasn't me, it was Jesus. And I always want to say, it wasn't that good. 
They're like, well, I don't wanna steal the glory of God. Let me point out that you can't steal the glory of God, you ain't that big. And not only that, but John 17, the Je Jesus is talking to his, his father, and he says to his father, Father, the glory, everybody say this, glory, come on, come on. The glory, everybody say it, the glory you've given to me, say this, given to me, I give to them. How many of you know that the glory that Jesus had from the Father, he gave to us? You, you can't steal what God gives you. I can't, I can't give my son my car, buy him a car, and he drives out of the driveway, and I call the cops and go, my son just stole my car. No, I gave him the car. In Romans 8, 28, we quote it all the time. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. How many of you raise your hand? Have you ever quoted that before in hard times? Do you... You guys, you have to try this. Just everyone just raise your hand for a minute. I just want to know you can. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, audience. Very good. All things work together for good for those who love God and call according to his purposes. Have you ever quoted that? Raise your hand if you have. Yes, see that? Like two-thirds of you know the Bible. And then, but what is the next verse? Why do all things work together for good? The next verse says, for whom he foreknew... He predestined. And whom he predestined, he called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, here it goes, he glorified. How many know that the reason why all things work together for good is because you were born for glory? <laughs> Listen, every time you say things to yourself, self-talk, or about yourself, oh, I'm just stupid. I'm just nobody. I'm just a piece of crap. You know what you just did? You insulted the creator. Because how many know, the father was the artist, Jesus was the model, and you're the painting. You cannot think bad about you without insulting him. Not only did he redeem you, but he made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Did you get that? You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. First, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Then he turned to you and goes, you're the light of the world. How many know that Jesus is the light of the world, but you're the light of the world? He said, I'm the righteousness of God. And then he said, you're the righteousness of God. How many know that not only am I saved and delivered, but I was born for glory. I was born to be a son. And my father, get this, I'll leave you with this. I'm almost done. My father, my daddy, is God. He's not president of presidents. He's king of kings. And I'm one of the kings he's king over because he seated me in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers, and he seated me with Christ in heavenly places. I, I want to just finish with this thought. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Everybody in, on this Zoom call needs to have a big ass. Because you can't love your neighbor unless you love you. And when you don't love you, you're not just, in, you're not just insulting God. It is costing your neighbor when you don't love you. So I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing with these today's students. And I pray, God, that you would cause the glory of the Lord <laughs> to arise in them, that you would break the spirit of false humility, that you would break the spirit of accusation, that thing that just accuses them day and night and says, you'll never be anything. You'll know, no one ever likes you. I break the power of shame in their life. I break the power of the devil in their life. I break the power of self-hatred in their life. And Lord, I release the power of the living God. I pray for a baptism in the Holy Spirit for everyone who's on this call. Lord, that there would be, even if they've been baptized before, I pray another infilling. Lord, that you would come in their life, that you would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And Lord, that you would drive out everything that says you are small, you'll never be anything, you were a victim. And I'd say, no, no, you're a child of the living God. 
The power of God flows through you because you sit on the throne with Jesus Christ. You become the righteousness of God in Jesus and you are God's hope for the world. His presence in you is the hope of glory. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. Love to have you all students. Bye now.